So my presentation is, is as much about as, as this about cinema of eco-horror. Uh, it is also about broader uh, philosophical and sociological movements reflected and embedded within that genre. Uh, and I will first be discussing these larger uh, social philosophical uh, developments, which have been um, summarized by, by Professor of Religion Paul Reed Bowen as um, in an all-encompassing term uh, called the Cthulhu scene. Uh, and then I'll be moving on to a more close reading of um, Andrei Tarkovsky's uh, 1979 sci-fi film uh, Stalker, which uh, in turn, I believe, um, it will serve as a very prominent case study um, exemplifying how eco-horror can um, echo that sort of new age that we're currently living in. Um, so... Now, allow me to elaborate on, on, on that term, uh, the Cthulhu scene, um, was coined by, by Reed Bowen uh, in, in his chapter on, in the edited volume Monstrous uh, Ontologies. Um, now, for the uninitiated, the Cthulhu scene is actually derived from two radically different yet uncannily similar sources, sources sorry, uh, and it is actually a um, um, sort of combination of two words, namely Cthulhu and the Anthropocene. Um, and the first word, Cthulhu, uh, find its origins with um, the horror writer H.P. Uh, Lovecraft, uh, which was an American writer of weird horror fiction uh, in the early decades of the, of the 20th century. Um, and perhaps most significant about, about Lovecraft fiction was actually his creation of very complex mythology um, of, of various creatures and, and indescribable entities um, older than the cosmos itself. Um, of whom Cthulhu was really the most uh, important well, or, or at least the most well-known one. Um, and Lovecraft's work is actually connected, uh, actually connects this, this elaborate web of mythological creatures uh, very, very interestingly and, and very, um, very well done. And, and his work is always about protagonists who really stumble upon these creatures um, and, and in their quest to, to, to understand what they're about, um, lose their insanity, um, or lose their sanity. Um, now, um, in Lovecraft's story, um, humanity really is a speck of dust in the vast darkness of the universe, in, in, inhabited by other than human or, or even more than human forces, which uh, are so vastly different from us that they can never be fully comprehended through human perception. Um, and that is perhaps the, the, the most important contribution that Lovecraft has made to, to popular culture, um, it is it is this sort of anti-humanistic vision that that Carl Cederholm and, and Andrew Weinstock describe as an anti-humanist uh, anti-humanist orientation that challenges universal human supremacy and rethinks the relation of the human to the non-human. So Cederholm and Weinstock also note that that we are currently living in an age of Lovecraft. Uh, in which the themes and influence of Lovecraft's writing have really bumbled up from the depths of, of, of 1930s pulp writing um, and have, have assumed a, a very prominent role uh, in, in, in the intellectual and, and cultural discourse. Um, so this is especially reflected in the social sciences and, and, and philosophy, uh, which have both really seen a rise in, in theoretical and, and metaphorical frameworks trying to to understand and explicate the, the, the inherently weird relationship between the human and non-human, um, and that, that Lovecraft really described and touched upon almost a century ago. Uh, so we have terms such as a new materialism, speculative realism, complexity theory, um, and Paul Reed Bowen, the, the author that I mentioned, really insists that we need to take three major hypotheses into account when discussing these sort of broader theoretical frameworks. And the first hypothesis uh, is actually that we inhabit an age and a world of monstrous agencies and powers. So in other words, we have to acknowledge that our world is populated with a sort of uh, multitude of non-human systems. Um, what is actually meant by this, what is actually meant by non-human systems, is, um, you know, think of, of sort of multinational corporations, financial markets, uh, capitalist regimes that are often thought of as, as vampiric in, in, in entity, uh, as, as Kennedy uh, beautifully wrote in his uh, book Vampire Capitalism. Um, but also think of nation-states, of metropolitan 
political cities and, and, and self-regulating bureaucracies that continuously uh, drive our lives forward instead of um, us driving these systems forward. Uh, but also think of artificial intelligence, surveillance culture, and algorithmic codes um, being a part of our digital reality, really. But especially think of ecological environments, uh, biotopes, and, and, and the powers of nature that uh, we, we continuously stumble upon. Um, and some of these systems, of course, are sort of uh, human construction and, and part of our social fabric, meaning that they are inherently meaningless, um, when, when humans don't give meaning to them. Um, some of them are more archaic, more primitive, uh, such as these ecological systems, and do really exist outside of uh, human interference and, and, and control. Now, what all of these different systems share, however, is that they long since succeeded any form of human containment, um, even if they were of human origin or originally. So these systems can produce practically any kind of effect we can imagine, and we can alter their course to some extent. Uh, but there will always exist this sort of inherently different space uh, and, and this distance between them and us. And uh, a very interesting writer in this is Mark uh, Fisher, who has written extensively about the strange life-sucking force that is capitalism, um, and stating that after the fall of the Soviet Union, actually, contemporary political systems have, have been structured, structured around a sort of ideological framework in which um, any alternative to capitalism really is, has become unimaginable. Um, and, and as a sort of monstrous virus of its own, it has really engulfed um, our political and, and, and cultural atmospheres. And we also have to mention uh, Morton's Dark Ecology, which has radically pushed forward a sort of object-oriented turn in, in discourses and narratives centered around ecology and, and, and nature, meaning that we really have to position the position ourselves on, on a sort of level, level playing field alongside non-human objects uh, such as trees, animals and rivers in order to provide a future uh, of, of, of peaceful coexistence. Um, now, following all of these sort of different metaphysical frameworks, um, Bowen says we have to think of another hypothesis. Oh yeah, that, that's an interesting picture as well, is that, you know, talking about this system is they do have really detrimental and, and monstrous effects uh, as we've seen in the last year from, from uh, the Gulf of Mexico being on fire, from fire forests in Greece to the pandemic and, and, and floods in Belgium. Um, so considering all these, these sort of grander uh, metaphysical frameworks, uh, there's a second hypothesis to consider, and that is to think of such a monstrous world is to cease to fixate on human personalities and purposes, instead uh, requiring a sort of mapping of new bestialities, ontological cartographies, and political ecologies. Now, what is meant by that is that if humans are not the epicenter of, of the Earth, there is really an urgent need to, to think of a new vocabulary and a new grammar uh, through which we can conceptualize this sort of monster-infested world. Uh, now, I will not be delving into too much detail about, about all these different <coughs> metaphysical frameworks. I think an important one to mention is, is object-oriented ontology, uh, which is more about redefining the, the, the notion of correlationalism, uh, which is uh, based really on the premise that, as, as Melassou said, we don't ever have access to the correlation between thinking and being, and never to either uh, term considered apart from one another. What is meant by this is that if I were to engage with an object, let's say an apple, uh, I would not be engaging with that apple itself, but with its touch on my hand, with its taste in my mouth, or with its smell through my nose. The thing in itself has really no meaning to me outside of the way that I engage with that object. Um, I think Morton puts it very beautifully. Uh, here's a quote of him stating that there is a drastic finitude that restricts my access to things in themselves. You can't know a thing fully by thinking it, or by eating it, or by measuring it, or by painting it. So the only thing um, that we can understand is the object as perceived through our senses. Now, of course, this drastically alters the outlook of our universe, which is not human-centered, uh, but according to object-oriented ontology, is really populated by countless of autonomous things in themselves. 
um, and it derails really any form of, of human supremacy. Um, objects and humans really share uh, the same space and time in equal measures. Uh, another important um, framework to consider is, is, is the philosophy of post-humanism, which is which displaces the notion of, of the human as a sort of uh, singular entity distinguishable from non-humans, and it really pushes away from the ideas propagated by, by its philosophical counterpart, humanism, which throughout Western philosophy has um, always enjoyed great prominence, and humanism actually um, states that or emphasizes agency, consciousness, and, and intentionality as the apex of existence, as the most important thing, um, and these abilities and things are uh, or belong exclusively to uh, humans. Now, post-humanism, um, as, as, as the word post accentuates, is that we should look what lies beyond that sort of mere human as, as a singular entity in itself. And post-humanism, to put it bluntly, really rejects any claim of anthropocentric dominance. Um, let's Oh, oh yeah, that's um, so. In contrast to to the human, the post-human should really argue for a doctrine and a practice of objectivity, um, and and should not be thought of as a sort of stable individual, uh, but it really should exist to understand the world from from multiple uh, point of views. Now, most um, post-human philosophers are fairly hopeful for for humanity's future. Um, there are more uh, pessimistic uh, overtones taken in the 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 Vent, uh, movement, which is the voluntary human extinction movement, uh, which is an ecological movement found in 1991 um, by Les Knight. Um, that actually states that we have to stop procreating immediately in order to save the planet, um, which then would result in the extinction of humanity, uh, which FEMP really sees as, as the only solution to, to our ecological uh, problems. It, it's, it's a very radical ideology that, that, that FEMP uh, takes on, but it is an interesting one. Um, they often refer to, to our planet as, as or our Earth as Gaia, a sort of holistic term that hints towards the Earth being an entity of its own uh, for which humans bear a certain responsibility, but are currently really acting as, as sort of unwanted uh, parasites. An interesting take on, on, on uh, Vemtis Wiseman's book, The World Without Us, uh, where he outlines a sort of thought experiment about what would happen if, if, if humans were to, um, to, to, to vanish of the face of the Earth immediately and, and how long would it take for uh, human uh, presence to, to completely be eradicated. Um, so I could go on about all these different human decentering takes on, on metaphysics, uh, but it suffice to say that, that there exists a sort of urge to, to understand and redefine that correlation between humans and non-humans. And in, in these, these systems, agency really is not an exclusive human trait, but is really distributed alongside different bodies of, of different matters. Um, so out of this all follows a sort of third uh, final hypothesis, and that is to adapt and survive in such a monstrous age may require that we reject the label of Anthropocene for something that better captures our status and existential predicament. So that term Anthropocene, uh, I think we all are familiar with, uh, is used to define an age where, where humans uh, have have really changed the course of geological history, uh, mostly thanks to the uh, agriculture and oil-driven industries. Uh, now, notwithstanding the critique that, that um, the term has uh, taken on, it um, nonetheless has made its way into its cultural and political discourse and is a very popular term nowadays to, to talk about ecological awareness and climate change. Yet what the critics of the term Anthropocene have said is that it really dominates again a sort of anthropocentric thinking, stay, placing the humans at the center of, 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 of everything. Um, but as Rebo notes, uh, that is a logical human fallacy to do so. It is due to our ability to really consciously perceive the world that, um, and I quote here, we routinely focus on human personalities, motives, values and vices, but without clearly recognizing that these are shaped, enabled and affected by much larger systems and agencies whose logics and principles are really not our own. 
Um, and these things then really take on uh, the sort of monsters lurking around in the literary work of Lovecraft in similar veins to Cthulhu and, and the Elder Gods mentioned in, in Lovecraft's Necronomicon. These monsters hiding in our world are really uncanny, dangerous and, and sometimes even life-threatening. Um, but we are also bound by them. We cannot really imagine a life without them. Um, so, although some of these monsters are social constructions, meaning that humans have created them, it by no means signifies that they desire some sort of unwanted form of, of Frankensteinian revenge, the urge to, to like, kill their own creator. It really simply means that these systems have since evolved and, and surpassed human purpose. Um, and have appropriated the sense of, of desired direction of their own. Um, so, following these three hypotheses mentioned uh, earlier, it feels appropriate and even necessary to conceive of another term defining this age where humans are struggling really to survive among different, dif different monstrous entities um, and, and are uh, really destroying human life as, as we know it. To conceive of, of that sort of world uh, with more than human entities is, is one thing, but if we agree on this, what do we have to do about it? Uh, do we need to slay or, or tame or annihilate these monsters? Uh, but since humans are both affected by them and also need them, their construction would be detrimental to our quality of life as well. So we should really look for ways to understand these monsters, to see them from a different perspective, and to learn how to uh, live alongside of them uh, in a peaceful coexistence, really. Um, and I believe, actually, that, that um, you know, Stalker uh, and Ecore in general uh, can provide a sort of preliminary understanding, uh, or at least these films, I think, aim to, um, and can serve as a powerful example uh, how cinema can take on an, an ethical role and, and, and really try to... to place uh, humans alongside these, these, these um, more than human entities, really. Um, so I'll be now focusing on, on, on Stalker. Um, Stalker was, was uh, Tarkovsky's last film before he left the Soviet Union in 1979 for his self-chosen exile um, um, since, uh, yeah, 1979, sorry. Um, so... Tarkovsky always had a sort of very um, difficult relationship with, with, with the authorities in, in the Soviet Union, uh, meaning that he was really never accused by the government of, of making sort of anti-communist propaganda films. His relationship with these authorities was really fragile at best. And this mainly had to do with the ambiguous nature of Tarkovsky's uh, cinema. That is, that um, close reading of his films, uh, for anyone who's seen uh, Tarkovsky's films, they never allow really for a singular interpretation of meaning. They are always uh, pretty vague on that. Um, and Tarkovsky, as, as, as Redwood states, uh, simply did not want his films to be understood intellectually at all. Taken at his word, he simply wanted his audience to absorb the films. So this left the the the. the communist authorities uh, responsible for censoring films with a really daunting task trying to determine whether Tarkovsky's films were criticizing the political system of the Soviet Union or not. Um, and the same really goes for Stalker, which um, has seen a multitude of, of interpretations throughout the years. Now, to briefly summarize, um, Stalker um, tells the story of three strangers, the Stalker, the Professor and the Writer, uh, all of whom have their own reasons for entering the zone, uh, a desolate place where, where laws of, of Newtonian physics do not seem to apply uh, and some form of otherworldly presence uh, can be felt. Now, the zone is an inherently eerie and, and, and weird place where traces of something strange, something unexplicable, have been left behind. Uh, and it is said that inside the zone there exists a sort of room of desires uh, which grants the deepest wishes, wishes of, of any person who steps inside. Uh, but because the zone is such a dangerous place, potentially lethal for, for those who are not familiar with it, uh, stalkers, such as our protagonist, uh, are hired by, these peop by people who wish to enter the zone and then travel to the room to have their wishes uh, granted. Now, as, as noted by... by Robert Byrd's research on, on Stalker, there have been many, many interpretations about what the zone actually uh, stands for symbolically. 
Um, there is uh, Belur's analysis, which states that zone is sort of transitionary space between memory and dreams, and, and Zizek has also put his take on it um, in a more psychoanalytical framework. But perhaps the most important interpretation is the one coming from Tarkovsky himself in his uh, book Sculpting in Time, uh, where he states that um, the zone is not a territory, but a test that results in a man either withstanding or breaking. Whether a man survives or not depends on his sense of worth, his ability to distinguish what is important from what is transient. So this statement really summarizes what Stalker is about. Um, the film, and, and I quote uh, Vida Johnson and, and Graham Petrie here, is that uh, the film presents a society apparently bent on self-deconstruction because it had lost all links with nature, its own past, and any sense of spiritual or moral dimensions to its behavior. And this idea is, is reflected in the two protagonists who hire the stalker to, to travel to the zone. At the beginning, both the professor and the writer have really lost any sense of, of faith or uh, hope in humanity or in, in human society. And to the professor, for example, there uh, exists nothing more than the empirical reality, the measurable reality made out of protons, neutrons and electrons, uh, a world really stripped away from any form of secrecy. The writer, on the other hand, uh, laments about his loss of, of artistic inspiration and the diminishing role of art in modern society um, and really having turned a cynic uh, who sees nothing more than, than misery, pain and loss. Um, and perhaps the most faithful of all three characters is the stalker uh, himself who seems to really respect the, the, the strangeness and, and, and the, the weirdness that permeates uh, the zone. Now, I believe Stalker can best be understood as a film that positions these two contrasting worldviews uh, against each other, one of faith and spirituality and a sense of humility uh, for, for larger-than-human systems, uh, for systems that we cannot really comprehend entirely, uh, placing it alongside a sort of uh, worldview of materialism and anthropocentric rationality. Uh, and throughout the film, these two worldviews world views are continuously pitted against each other as these three men delve into the zone and making their beliefs really explicit throughout conversation and, and monologues while uh, taking their, their, their journey into the zone. Um, now, it has been claimed by, by a lot of critics that there is actually not really any psychological arc present in, in these characters, um, which I do not really agree with, since we can note that, for example, the professor and the writer uh, at the end of the film, change their sort of uncompromising philosophies to some extent. Um, the professor, for example, refuses to enter the room once they reach their destination, which seems to imply uh, some form of modesty from his part um, against this sort of um, inexplicable experience that he has that he has faced. And the writer also, in similar fashion, uh, does not enter the room. He initially wishes to do so to gain some sort of selfishly really to gain some sort of artistic inspiration uh, but when 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 facing the room he cowardly backs out um, presumably not wanting to be confronted with with his deepest desires because requiring um, being in the room requires to be honest something that the writer really is uh, not up to um, so for Tarkovsky it's actually the stalker who presents the most ideal version of humanity uh, the stalker really explicitly favors the weak and, and, and the flexible and the open-minded above the strong-headed and the severe. And there's actually a, a very beautiful quote within the film um, um, which comes from, from the Chinese Tao Te Ching, a foundational text uh, for the spiritualism of, of, uh, or the spiritual tradition of, of Taoism, uh, where it states that weakness is a great thing. Uh, and strength is nothing. When a man is just born, he is weak and flexible. When he dies, he is hard and insensitive. When a tree is growing, it's tender and pliant. But when it's dry and hard, it dies. Hardness and strength are death's companions. Pliancy and weakness are expressions of the freshness of being, because what is hardened will never win. So the stalker embodies that sort of philosophical position of, of that sort of faith and hope, which, according to Tarkovsky, is crucial if, if humanity uh, and human societies to survive in a modern world filled with otherworldly presences uh, that, that are not really recognized within uh, sort of human uh, rationality. Um, so, interestingly enough, the zone, uh, or that journey into the zone, 
not only feels feels strange for characters themselves, but it also feels strange for an audience. You know, the the moment that these men enter the zone, uh, spatial and and temporal orientation or the passing of time is completely absent in the film. Uh, for all we know, at the end of the film, their journey could have taken a few hours, a few weeks, uh, even a few months. Um, Tarkovsky is never really explicit about it. Um, and Tarkovsky also not really presents a sort of mental map um, about uh, or of the zone uh, geographically um, and it, he doesn't allow his viewers to connect the various landscapes that these men encounter and even when they are in one specific location uh, the zone, uh, spatial orientations in the zone uh, remain vague at, at, at best. So in the end the zone really becomes an entity of its own uh, with its own gravitational pull and its own physical loss. Uh, and this is also reflected in the cinematography of, of Stalker uh, with, with very long takes uh, that either remain static or, or move forward almost imperceptibly um, where Stalker truly constructs for his audience sort of own dreamlike atmosphere and, and an own uh, strange logic. So I hope that by this point it has become obvious uh, why I've chosen Stalker as a case study to exemplify how the genre of eco horror we've been talking about uh, this afternoon uh, may help us to rethink that sort of anthropocentric position within a monster uh, or other uh, than human infested worlds. And I believe Stalker succeed in, in, in constructing a world where humans um, are entirely diminished really and reduced when put into perspective with something as mysterious and inexplicable as, as the zone. Uh, not only are these sort of philosophical perceptions uh, embedded or, or reflected in the, in the characters, but it, they're also um, reflected in uh, our viewing of Stalker um, and, and where our perception of the zone is profoundly incomprehensible and, and strange. So um, Tucker, Tarkovsky accomplishes to immerse his audience into perceiving what feels like to be inside the zone and to be a part of the zone. And the zone then becomes something monstrous, something different and, and larger than us that we cannot comprehend. Now, this, the characters who take their journey into the zone showcase that it is only by positioning ourselves into this uncharted territory and, and by pushing our own boundaries of, of anthropocentric thinking uh, that we can, uh, in fact, redirect our, our ontological gaze uh, of the world uh, where these other than human systems uh, live alongside of us. Um, and I end by, by again, quoting uh, Rick Bowen's own words, where he states that learning to live and, and die in the Cthulhu scene requires beginning to recognize these monstrous co-inhabitants and then attempting to liaise and interact with them in whatever ways are most appropriate and uh, efficacious. So it is really not an age of humans in which we live, it is an age of, of monsters and, and what eco-horror and stalker and, and all these metaphysical frameworks try to um, try to say is that if we don't start communicating with them, we might uh, be destroyed by them before we even realize it. So I uh, thank you very much for, uh, for this interview. Thank you.